Well, this morning we begin a series during the season of Lent focused on what God's Word teaches us about prayer. And prayer is one of those things that if you go to church for a while, you're going to hear about quite a bit. You're going to do it in the services. It's one of those things that people know is important to their lives. It's one of those things that I hear from many members in every church I've been a part of that prayer is important. I enjoy prayer. And then I also get the, especially during the season of Lent, because that's a time of reflection and wanting to grow in our faith, set a goal of, I want to improve in prayer. Anybody ever said that? I want to grow in my prayer life? Or how many of you think and agree with me that prayer is important to the Christian life? All right. In the epistle reading, which was three verses long, but super short verses, apparently, all right. <laughs> Paul says, pray without ceasing. How many of you ever stopped praying in a sense, right? You're just like, well, I don't know what that means, right? And so we know the Bible tells us to pray, to pray frequently, to pray without ceasing. We know prayer is an important part of our relationship with God. Many times we set the goal, I've done it myself, where I want to pray more. One of my heroes of the faith is a man named Martin Luther. And he journaled and wrote in letters that he would spend two hours a day in prayer, which I always found very impressive. And then he said, if I knew I was going to have a busy or stressful or difficult day or week, I would then spend three hours in prayer before getting it all done. Again, I found that incredibly profound and amazing because If I'm honest with you, I'm not going to make you feel bad. I'll just confess my own shortcomings, that if I know I'm going to have a stressful day or week or I've got a lot going on, I know it's going to be jam-packed and really busy. Can I tell you, to be honest, I don't generally add an extra prayer, hour of prayer, in my morning before I get into all of it. Do any of you? All right. Now, maybe some of you do. I've always found it, wow, I can't believe Luther was like, oh, yeah, and when the day gets really busy, I spend an extra hour in prayer. So prayer is one of these interesting things where we see wonderful examples of people that have gone before us praying a lot. We know it's commanded in the Bible. We know that God wants us to do it. And many of us, we have the desire to do it and the desire to do it even more. But... Anybody ever felt like you came up short on your goal to pray more? I'm going to do it this year, right? I'm going to, I'm going to add an extra time of prayer in the morning. Well, I woke up too late, so I'll pray in the car and say, race to work, right? Sometimes we, we set these goals, or sometimes we also feel like, what difference does prayer make? So on the one end, I see people, we have a desire to grow in prayer. We will want to do it more, or we, we try to do it more. We know it's important. On the other hand, I've met people that have said, well, I tried that, and it didn't work. Now, maybe you've been at a point in your life where you were praying your heart out, and you were praying your soul out to the Lord, and, and it didn't go the way you were praying for. And so Satan comes along and convinces you, well, what good was that. So what I want to do as we study God's word in the coming weeks about what prayer is and and what God's word teaches us about prayer is I want us to be a church and I want you as individuals to be people who take prayer seriously. And what I mean by that is I'm going to say some things you may not be like, woo, good job, pastor. Okay. How many of times, don't raise your hand on this one, have you ever told somebody, I will pray about it, and then you forgot? I'll say it the nice way, you forgot to pray about it. I know I have. I'm not proud of that, but anybody else forgotten? Don't yet. Yeah, don't, don't be like, hey, it was me. All right. <laughs> Sometimes we do that, though, right? I want to pray for you. I'm going to pray about that. Maybe we had good intentions, but sometimes we forget. Sometimes we are going through things in life, 
and it's a struggle or it's a battle. And then someone comes along and asks the question, have you prayed about it? That's a good question, right? Because what does Paul say? Pray without what? Ceasing, which means you should probably be what? Praying about it. But let's be honest. If we're in church. It's a good place to be authentic with God and ourselves. We get told, have you prayed about it? Anybody ever just kind of rolled your eyes? Maybe like on the inside? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, pray about it. Of course I've prayed about it. Now, here's the deal. I've done this before, too. Yet I'm not proud of it. I don't think it's a good example. Where, yeah, I'll, I'll pray about it. Yeah, and, and just to be able to say to people that ask you that question, oh, I've prayed about it, or to be able to declare publicly, yes, I've prayed about this. Anybody ever just done, like, the short, quick prayer just to get over with? You're like, oh, I'm going to pray about it. And then immediately, after you pray, you dived into doing it your way with your ideas and your plans. Anybody ever been guilty of that? You're like, oh yeah, I prayed about it, but it was just like, check it off the list, right? And then you can get to doing it yourself. And in another way, I think we struggle with prayer and taking it seriously, is that we treat it like a last ditch effort. I don't think we intend to always. I don't think we mean it because, right, earlier we all agreed, prayer is important. It's, it's a part of our faith life. It's a wonderful gift from God. We know it's good. But I'm just asking us to take a moment to be honest in our hearts with God. Have you ever taken prayer as just a last-ditch effort, right? Here's what I mean. Either on your own or sometimes when you get together at a church meeting, I've seen it happen. Well, we've done everything else we can think of. So I guess now we'll pray. Oh, good, so you do have experience with this. And I'm not saying brag about it, but let's just be honest about it. Of, are there times in our lives where prayer is viewed as, oh yeah, that thing we should kind of do? Or maybe it's that last ditch effort, or, well, we've, I've done everything I can do. I guess it's up to God now. I've heard that before. <laughs> like, you should reverse that. It's always up to God. <laughs> but I think sometimes we struggle with this. Pray without ceasing. Man, that's a neat idea, isn't it? How many of you are going to walk out here and go, I'm going to do that now? Just pray without ceasing. So as we study God's word, here's what I want for you and for us as a church, that we would take prayer seriously and that we would treat it as a gut reaction. Our natural instinct would be to pray for each other and together for our church and together as a church rather than what I've also been guilty of in my life, and it's just... It's that thing we do sometimes to check it off a list. Well, we've done everything else, so let's pray. So what I want to do today is you open your Bibles. I want you to open a Bible to Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to start. We're going to look at several passages this morning. But the first key to taking prayer seriously, making it our natural reaction, our, our, our natural instinct, our gut reaction to circumstances and things in life, making it our default language is understanding who we are praying to. So today, I'm not going to give you tips and practical suggestions on prayer techniques and how to be like Luther and squeeze an extra hour of prayer into your day. What I want to do this morning is help create a, a solid foundation for all of our prayer lives, a foundation that is founded in understanding who it is that we are praying to. So if you are a note taker, the first thing that we're going to look at today is who we pray to, because here's the reality. Who you pray to affects how you pray and how often you pray and what you pray for. Understanding the God you are praying to impacts and shapes and transforms your prayer life. 
And so in Matthew chapter 6, we're going to see a couple of examples of this. It's right before Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. And the beginning of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel in verse 9 is, therefore you should pray like this. So Jesus is telling us there is a way to pray that is holy and pleasing to God, and he's going to explain that. But one of the things that he does right before this is say, here's a couple of ways I don't want you to pray. And it's not about, are you folding your hands? Are you raising them to the sky? Are you kneeling? Are you laying down? Are you sitting? It's not about that. What Jesus is trying to teach you and me that is foundational to our entire prayer lives is understanding who it is we are praying to. So in Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 5. Jesus says, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And what he's referring to here is really good religious people. So just, you know, it might be you. (laughs) It might not be. But that's who he's referring to when he says hypocrites. He's referring to what we would call good Bible-believing churchgoers. So there might be a a little bit of sting to Jesus' words here. So here's what he's saying. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the good religious people because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Now, I don't think that that directly is a struggle for many of you of walking out, standing on the corner of Rainbow and praying really loudly so everybody walking by and driving by hears you. What Jesus is getting at is the heart of the issue for them. It's not just their actions. It's what's going on in their heart. It's how they view God. And so as these hypocrites, as these religious people, what Jesus is pointing out, if you look at their lives throughout the Gospels, is that they believe their prayer is dependent on how good they are. So their view of God that is affecting their prayer life is you can't always trust him to like you. You can't always trust him to love you. He's only going to listen to you if you deserve it. He's only going to hear your prayers if you've been good, if you've done the right things. Now, here's how I see this play out sometimes as a pastor. Because, by the way, the hypocrites that Jesus really hates in the Gospels are pastors. It's fun for me. People come up to me, and they'll be praying for something. And I I love praying with you, and I love praying for you. And they'll be like, well, pastor, I've been praying about it. It hasn't really worked out. And I've had hundreds of people in my ministry say this to me. But if you will pray for me, it's like a wink. They're winking at me. Like... Don't wink at me when you're making a prayer request, okay? They'll come up and go, but if you could pray for me, if you could pray with me, then I know God will hear it. Now, what are we doing then? We're behaving like these people that Jesus says, don't do that, because that has a wrong view of the God we are praying to. That view affects your prayer life in the way that you think, well, you've got to be really close to God. You've got to be super religious. You've got to be doing all the right things for him to love your prayers and to hear your prayers. And Jesus says, don't pray like that. Don't view the God you are praying to like that because he's not like that. And then he goes on in verse 7. He says, also, another way we mess up. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. So he's saying, okay, you got got the religious people over here who think they're doing it right because they've got all the performance down. They've got all the good things down. They're doing all this stuff to keep God happy. And if they keep God happy, he's guaranteed to hear our prayers. And if you don't keep God happy, well, that's why he's not answering your prayers. 
And over here, Jesus says, well, you got the Gentiles who, who say pagans or, or unbelievers. In our day and age, we would say people that would claim to be very spiritual but not religious, right? And they're saying, oh, I, I'm re- spiritual. I believe in a divine presence, and so I'm going to trust the universe. I'm going to pray. I'm going to do all the right rituals. I'm going to do all these different things, and I'm going to repeat them over and over and over and over again until what? Until I get an answer. Now, here's the deal. That view of God impacts your prayer life because in that view, God can't be known. It's just, it's just all spiritual. You have no guarantee if he actually heard your prayers because it's just going out there into the universe. And Jesus is saying, don't pray like that because our God, the God he's going to reveal to us to be the one we pray to, is known. We personally know him. And we know that he hears us. And so in both instances, Jesus said, don't pray like that. And the problem isn't necessarily in the rituals or the words being said. The problem at the root of it is it's a misunderstanding of who God is, of who I am praying to. Now, here's the good news for you and me. In the book of Revelation, we're told that the prayers of the saints, which means anybody that believes in Jesus, anybody that's loved by Jesus, you're a saint, ascend to God like a pleasing aroma. So that means your prayers, even on your worst day, even when you feel like I've not nailed it at all, (laughs) your prayers are still going to God like a pleasing aroma. The question is, why? Well, verse 9, Jesus tells you, therefore, you should pray like this. So don't pray like God is this angry judge, and I got to perform for him and meet his standards, otherwise he won't listen to me. Don't pray as if God can't be known or he can't be talked to personally or he can't be reached. Pray then like this, our Father. So Jesus is defining the who that it is that you and I pray to. You are praying to a heavenly father. And here's what that means. Why it's such good news for you and I, and it will change your prayer life. It means you can be on your worst day (laughs) as a follower of Jesus. You can feel just really like, I have not done it right at all. I've got it all wrong this week. And you can still come to him and say, Father in heaven. And you can know for certain he will hear that prayer. And you can go to him and you can call him by name and say, you're my father in heaven. And you can know for certain that he's going to hear your prayer. And you don't have to have a bunch of rituals. You don't have to do all kinds of physical performance. You don't have to say all the right words. And you can know for certain that he's going to hear your prayer. One of my favorite Bible verses is in Romans chapter eight. There's a lot of good ones in that chapter, but one of my favorites is when he says, when you and I don't have the words to say, when it's just sighs and groaning and tears, the Holy Spirit takes all that and translates it into a prayer for the Father to hear. I just think about that. Even if I don't feel like I'm a great Christian, feeling far from God, don't have everything right. Jesus is saying, here's how I want you to pray, my Father in heaven. And even when you feel like, I don't know how to pray, I don't know the right words to say, I don't know if I'm supposed to kneel or stand or fold my hands or whatever it is, Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray, my Father in heaven. That is who you and I are praying to every single time. And the good news is that we have a certainty that no matter what, we can approach him. We can bring all of our prayer and requests to him. And we can know for certain that he is a God who hears our prayers. 
Because it doesn't matter if you do it the religious way or the Gentile way. Both of those leave you uncertain about, did God really hear my prayer? Does he really care? Is he really listening? But the Jesus way of praying, when he says, I want you to pray like this, begins with, our Father in heaven guarantees that, no, he does care, and he does hear, and he does listen, and he does answer our prayers. So if you get this right, and you remember every day, this is who I'm praying to, I guarantee you it will transform your prayer life, because it won't be about the performance. It won't be about your behavior. It won't be about if you got the right words or how long it was or how short it is. It'll be all about I'm praying to a father who loves me. The second thing is that we need to understand what we believe about the God we are praying to. So Jesus teaches us, here's the first step. You need to know who you are praying to. The second step is what do we believe about him? And so in Matthew chapter 21, in our gospel reading this morning, Jesus has this parable of a fig tree, and he interacts with the disciples. They see a miracle happen, and they don't believe it. They don't understand it, which is, you know, normal behavior for a human being. And then Jesus begins to teach them about prayer and faith. And so in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus <laughs> says to them, you will be able to move mountains. That's pretty impressive, right? Jesus is saying, if you have faith, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will be done. How many of you like Jesus? Show of hand. Like, be really bold this morning, Lutherans. Come on. All right. I know we don't say amen, but show of hands for Jesus is good. How many of you think Jesus is always telling you the truth in his word? Okay, good. You're with me so far? All right, let's look at it again. Matthew 21, verse 21. Jesus says, I tell you this. <clears throat> You will be able to say to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea. It will be done. So let's just, you know, re-agree here. How many of you like Jesus? You love Jesus. How many of you believe Jesus is always telling you the truth in his word? All right. You still with me? Okay. So here's what Jesus says. You'll be able to tell this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will be done. And then verse 22, and if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So you, do you still believe Jesus is telling you the truth in his word? Show of hands. Yeah, of course he is. So what is he trying to teach us? Well, he's trying to teach us, here's what you need to believe about the God, about the heavenly Father you are praying to. I'm going to summarize it for you very easily. He is our heavenly father who can do anything. That's what Jesus is saying. And it takes faith to trust those words. You can say to this mountain, move from here to there. Another uh, gospel account says, move from here and be thrown into the sea and it will be done. You know what Jesus doesn't say? And I'll think about it. He doesn't say, and it might happen if you're good, or it could happen if you say it all the right way with the right technique. What does he say? It will be done. And then he says, and if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So Jesus teaches, here is what you need to believe about your heavenly Father when you go to him in prayer. He's the God that can take a mountain and move it from here to there, and it will be done. That's who you're praying to. 
Yes, it's beautiful that he is our father who hears our prayers. He's our father who comforts us. He's our father who hears our sighs and groanings. But Jesus is trying to expand our understanding. He's trying to expand our faith as we go to this father in prayer and say, he's the God who can literally move a mountain. Understanding who that father is. He has that power. He has that authority. Now, for me... This was life-changing in my prayer life. I realized if I am praying to a father who hears my prayers and loves me, and I'm praying to a father who can move a mountain from here to there, what could possibly be too big of a prayer request for him? Just think about that for a moment. Jesus is saying, this is who you're praying to, a father who loves you, a father who hears your prayers, a father who's able to move mountains from here to there. So Jesus is saying, what could you possibly ask for in prayer that is too hard or too big for him to be able to do? One of the things that I've seen in my own life and also observed as a pastor over the years is we often negotiate our prayers down. Here's what I mean by this. Just show of hands, how many of you have ever had what you would say is a really big, ridiculous prayer request? Just anybody, you're like, I don't sound, it feels like a mountain needs to be moved, right? So we start with, Lord, I love you, all right? I was taught, always start your prayers with, Heavenly Father, that's how my mom taught us to pray, so I still do this to this day. How do you begin your prayers? Pray I say, Heavenly Father, why? Because my mom told me to, okay? So it's just, it's stuck, all right? Heavenly Father, I need you to move this mountain. And I guarantee, as a human being, all of us have had things that felt like a mountain that was impossible to move, that we needed God to move, right? So we start, my Heavenly Father, who loves me and hears my prayers, I need you to move this mountain. Now, what I've been guilty of in my own prayer life at times, and I've observed as a pastor, is by the time we get to the end of the prayer, right before we say amen, we so often go, you know what? Moving the mountain seems really big. Seems kind of impossible. So if you could just move a couple of the boulders, that would be really helpful. And you know what? Those boulders seem really big and heavy to move out of the way. So if you could just like move some of the dirt out of the way, that'd be really great. Amen. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But I don't think I'm the only one that's ever been guilty of this. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll pray for anything. Jesus said it. This is not Pastor Mark making things up, just trying to get you hyped for the next week. This is Jesus saying it. And all y'all, I'm angry. All y'all said, yeah, we love Jesus. We believe he's telling us the truth. And so we begin in all kinds of excitement, right? Well, I got this mountain to move, Jesus. If you could just move it, that'd be really great. Well, that seems selfish. That seems too hard. That seems too big. Maybe God's too busy. He doesn't have time for it. And we're forgetting who we're praying to, what he's capable of. So by the end of it, we just go, you know what? If you could just move some of the dirt, I'll take care of the rest of the mountain. Amen. And Jesus wants you and I to not pray like that. He wants you and I to pray really, really big, ridiculously sounding, giant mountain moving prayers. You know how I know that? Because Jesus has told us, be lifted up and thrown in the sea, it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. My whole evidence to you to pray like this is I believe the words Jesus says. That's it. 
And what Jesus wants you and I to believe about prayer is believing the right things about our Father in heaven, that he is the God who can actually move what you feel like is an impossible mountain to move in your life. And I have a couple other stories from God's word that I want to share with you about this. One is about a man named Abraham and Sarah. Anybody heard of them? They made wonderful promises that God had given to them. Miraculous promises. And if you read the story, they're ridiculous promises. They're way too big. And then God comes along after making some of those promises and he tells Abraham and he tells Sarah two different instances Here's how I'm going to begin keeping those promises. I'm going to give you a son. And Abraham, that great man of faith, responds by laughing in God's face. I'm not exaggerating. It's literally what the Bible says. Abraham began to laugh at God and said, how's that going to be? Because I'm really old. And then Abraham had a little bit of wisdom. He goes, and my wife's a little bit advanced in years, too. He didn't call her old. <laughs> He's just like, she's a little advanced in years, too. A couple chapters later, God shows up and tells Abraham again that he's going to do it. And this time, Sarah overhears the conversation outside the tent. And Sarah, this great woman of faith, hears God's promise, this impossible mountain-moving promise. And you know what her response is? She laughs in God's face. And that's why they call him Isaac, because Isaac means to laugh, because God's got a sense of humor. And here's the point. After God makes these promises and says, I'm going to keep my promises, Abraham laughs. Then he shows up again and says, no, I'm really going to keep my promise, and here's how. Sarah laughs. And then God responds to both of their laughter by asking them a rhetorical question. He says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, I would love to be a great man of faith and always say, absolutely not, Lord. Of course, nothing is too hard for you, even the most ridiculous miracle. But I've got to be honest. Sometimes I join Abraham and Sarah in laughing, going, that seems ridiculous. I want you to be honest. Jesus says, you'll be able to say to this mountain, move from here to here, and it will be done. How many of us, on the one hand, really want to believe those words? You don't have to raise your hand on the second question, but how many times, if we're honest, we sometimes feel like Abraham and Sarah laughing, going, that seems, seems kind of ridiculous, seems impossible. So another Bible story for you. If you go left in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, there's a story of a rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus seeking eternal life. And Jesus and him have a conversation. And the man says, I've done all that. I've done all the good stuff. I've kept all the commandments. And Jesus says, great, one thing you lack, sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, and then follow me. And the man is not able to do it. He walks away sad, the Bible says, because he had great wealth. And in response, the disciples ask a question in verse 25 of Matthew 19. Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. All things things are possible. I get asked what Greek words and Hebrew words are a lot. I don't always know, but I know what this one is. The Greek word for all here is pan, P-A-N. If you're a note taker, write it down. I always get asked, well, what does the Greek really mean? And here's what the Greek really means. It means all. There's zero other ways to translate the word pan. So when Jesus says all things are possible with God, what do you think he really means? All things. So whatever thing you think is impossible for the disciples was, can that person be saved? Can that spouse be saved? Can that child, can that grandchild be saved and have faith in Jesus? It feels impossible. It feels like a giant mountain. Abraham and Sarah were saying, can you provide us with children or grandchildren? It feels impossible. The devil wants you and I 
to look at the promises of Jesus, the words of Jesus, and to join Abraham and Sarah in laughing, going, it seems too ridiculous. And friends, Jesus is saying, all things are possible with who? God, who do we pray to? God, the God who is able to do what? All things. So I don't care, I really don't, how big you think your mountain is that needs to move, or how ridiculous it sounds, or how impossible it feels. Because the very words of your Savior, Jesus, says, with your God, with your heavenly Father that you are praying to, all things are possible. All of them. And if we believe that about our God that we are praying to, how much bigger and bolder could your prayers become? I gotta be honest, I, I struggled with this for years. I was awesome at giving the humble Lutheran prayer where I would start really big and then by the time I was at the end, your will be done, just make it really small, amen. I was awesome at it. Not proud of that. But it took learning from mentors of mine, this reality that the God I'm praying to, the Father who loves me and hears my prayers every single day is also the God who is able to do all things and move any mountain from here to there. And it completely transformed my prayer life to where I not just pray for myself that way, but I pray for you that way. So here's an example. Doing visits this week, met with a member who has a very serious and terrifying diagnosis. And so we were praying for healing. And here's how I used to pray for healing. Lord, if it's your will, amen. Anybody ever prayed that way? I'm not saying God, praying for God's will is bad, but I do believe Jesus wants us to pray for bigger prayers than that. The prayers that ask him to actually move mountains. And so this week I prayed for that member in a way that I'm gonna teach you today. Lord, we know you are going to do this miracle one day or another. We know that through your resurrection and through your return, you're going to heal all things. That's in the Bible. It's the final promise of Jesus in your Bible. He says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to heal all things. So when you and I pray for healing and it feels like a miracle and it seems ridiculous and it seems like too big of a mountain, Jesus says it's not because I'm going to do it. What we are asking for in prayer is for God to move the timeline up. And say, oh, I know you're gonna do it then. What we're asking in faith now is, could you do it here and now for us? So here's the third thing that I want you to learn today, is how to pray. And here's how we pray. We pray in faith and we pray in hope. We pray in faith of who our God is, that he's our Father who hears every single one of our prayers. He's a Father who loves us. He's a Father who can move mountains and do what seems impossible. At the end of Revelation in chapter 21, Jesus makes a promise to John and to you and to me and all of his people. He says, one day I'm gonna return, and I'm gonna be with my people. And then he says, and I'm gonna wipe away every tear, and I'm gonna get rid of mourning and grief and sorrow. He says, because the old way is gonna go away. And he says, there's not gonna be sorrow or death anymore. And then he makes this wonderful promise. He says, when I come back, I will make all things new. By the way, there's that word again. Not just some things, but what? All things. So you have a promise from Jesus saying, here is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna make all things new. And in fact, the Bible through the prophet Isaiah promises to level every mountain and get rid of all of them. And he says, that's what I'm gonna do. 
I'm going to get rid of all those mountains. I'm going to get rid of all that sorrow and grief and uncertainty. Here's what I'm going to do for you. So when you and I pray, what we're doing is we're praying in faith that Jesus keeps his promises. That's what prayer looks like. It's saying, God, I know you are a God who keeps his promises. And so this mountain seems unmovable. I've been digging at it for decades but I know that you can, and here's more importantly, he says, I know that you will. Because Jesus says, I'm gonna make all things new. So he's saying, I'm gonna do it. So when you and I pray in faith, what we're asking Jesus to do is move the timeline up, saying, I know you're gonna do this, Lord. I know you're the God of miracles. I know you're the God who can do all things. I'm asking you to do it here and now. So it doesn't matter if it feels it's impossible. It doesn't matter how big the mountain is. Jesus is saying, I'm going to do it. And here is how I want to encourage you. Of how can I know I can trust Jesus' promises? And the Bible says, here's how you can trust his promises. He rose from the dead. That's the answer. He did the most impossible, impossible thing when he moved the mountain of the stone that was in front of his tomb and walked out of his grave, y'all. And he said, see, I've conquered everything, every mountain, every kind of sin, every death, every grief and mourning, and I'm guaranteeing you that I'm going to do it for you when I make all things new. So here's how we pray. Say, you are my Father in heaven who loves me and hears my prayers. You are my Father who is able to do all things and move whatever mountain is before me. And I'm praying in faith because I know Jesus has risen from the dead. And I know he will make all things new again. So, Lord, I'm just asking you to move up the timeline and do it here and now. I just want you to hear me clearly. It is not weird or dumb or prideful or ridiculous for you to go to God in prayer and say, move this mountain. Because Jesus told you to pray that way. So whatever it is, no matter how big it is or hard or difficult it seems, he's saying, here's what I want you to pray, that you would trust that I will make all things new. Now here's one last encouragement for you. Because sometimes we're gonna struggle, right? It's my favorite prayer in the whole Bible. There was a man with a sick son who was demon-possessed and nothing could cure him. What a helpless feeling. And it felt impossible. And he even came to the disciples and says, you guys do it, and they couldn't. And so he came to Jesus as a last-ditch resort. I've never been guilty of that. And he shows up to Jesus and goes, if you can. And Jesus was indignant and responds to him and says, if I can. And he looks at the man and says, all things are possible with God. And the man's prayer request response to Jesus was, I believe, but help my unbelief. So here's my encouragement to you. Maybe you are struggling and the mountain feels so impossible. You're like, I don't know where to start. Just start there. Say, Lord, I believe. I need you to help my own belief. And then each day, just remember, this is who I'm praying to. I'm praying to a Father who loves me, who is able to move mountains, and to a Jesus who will make all things new. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are a God who makes and keeps your promises. We know that because you have risen from the dead, you have done the most impossible task, which is giving to us salvation and rescue from sin, death, and the devil. And we know that when you return, you will make all things new. So Lord, we pray in hope and faith, trust that you keep your promises, and that you will move mountains in our lives here and now. In your holy name we pray, amen.